This slideshow will teach you how the salamander crossing brigades work, including how to find amphibian crossing sites, what to bring with you in the field on migration nights, and what to expect when you go out on big night. If you haven't already watched the other slideshows on amphibian ecology and conservation and species identification, we encourage you to check those out as they provide valuable context for this slideshow. In addition, the separate slideshow on staying safe on big nights is an absolute must. The goals of the Salamander Crossing Brigades are threefold. First, to reduce roadkill associated with the spring amphibian migration. Second, to provide data that can help inform land protection projects and road improvements for wildlife. And third, to increase public support for amphibian conservation. So what do the Salamander Crossing Brigades do exactly? This is divided into two time periods, before the big nights and on the big nights. Before the big nights, we ask all volunteers to attend a volunteer training, or in this case, to watch our series of training videos. So congratulations, you're halfway there. Next, we ask people to stay on call. As you'll remember, the amphibian migration is entirely weather dependent. So we can't know very far in advance when it's going to happen. What does staying on call involve and how can you find out when big nights will happen? First, we encourage you to sign up for our Salamander Crossing Brigade email lists at harriscenter.org. We have two types of lists. The first is our main Crossing Brigade email list for anyone and everyone in our Salamander community, New Hampshire and beyond. These emails come from the Harris Center. They include field reports from big nights, salamander news, and of course notifications when we think a migration is imminent in the Monadnock region. Starting in 2021, we're also experimenting with a second type of list, a site-specific email list, where people who are interested in going out at specific crossing sites or in certain towns can be in touch with one another to plan for their time on the road. This might mean making sure that someone else might be out there at the same time as you, so you don't have to be alone, or seeing that there's a ton of interest in going out on any particular night and deciding to go somewhere else instead, or even to stay home. Now we try not to send too many emails. We don't wanna burden your inbox. So if you're ever curious whether a migration is in the works and you haven't heard from us, you can always go to our website and check out the five-day salamander forecast, which we update almost daily during salamander season, which in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire runs from mid-March through early May. The salamander forecast has color-coded red, yellow, and green, as well as a narrative explaining the nuanced differences and how things might be different from one part of the region to another. Now, of course, this is also focused on the Monadnock region. So if you're further afield, or even if you don't feel like checking in with the forecast every few days, you can always do what we do and simply watch the weather. The three pieces of information that we look for when formulating our salamander forecast is whether the ground has thawed and there's minimal snow cover, whether nighttime temperatures are expected to be 40 degrees or higher, and whether there is rain in the forecast after dark. That's what you should look for too. One last thing to do before the big nights while you're on call is to prepare your field gear. Here's what you should bring or wear whenever you go out on the road for a big night. First and foremost, you should be wearing a reflective vest so that cars can see you better. This is an essential piece of safety equipment. If you do not yet have a reflective vest or can't find the one you do have, do not go out on the road on big night. It is that important. You can buy reflective vests at nearly any hardware store, sporting goods store, and of course on the internet. But if cost is a barrier for you and you live in the Monadnock region, the Harris Center may have a reflective vest that you can borrow. Just drop us a line. Another piece of safety equipment is a face mask to cover your mouth and nose whenever you are around someone who's not a member of your household or pandemic pod. This includes at amphibian crossings. Next, you'll wanna make sure that you have rain gear, both a jacket and rain pants. It will be raining. That is the whole point of big night and rain gear will help you stay a lot more comfortable when you're out there. 
In addition, we often say that these are the first warm, rainy nights of spring, but warm to a wood frog who can literally freeze solid and survive is not the same thing as warm to a human being. And an hour or two out in 42 or 43 degree rains can get pretty chilly, so bundle up. Next, you'll wanna make sure that you have a bright light. Cell phone flashlights are not sufficient. You need a handheld flashlight or a headlamp or both for big night. Headlamps are great for seeing your data form and being seen from a distance, but when it comes to looking for amphibians on the road, nothing beats a handheld flashlight where you can direct the beam. It's also really crucial that you have fresh batteries in those lights or that they're fully charged before heading out because nothing is more frustrating or less safe than being out on the road with a dying flashlight. Next, you'll wanna make sure you bring data forms or a notebook so that you can record your counts. You can download data forms at harriscenter.org and you'll wanna bring a pencil. So if you're at a site that has a site coordinator, which we'll talk about in a few slides, they may have data forms for you that are printed on right in the rain paper. This is special paper that has a waxy coating that won't fall apart if it gets wet. But even if you're using regular paper, pencils are best for writing in the rain. Pens do not work nearly as well. You'll want to bring a clipboard or a notepad, something to lean on with your data form. You're definitely going to want to have your camera or your phone to take pictures because these are incredible animals and you're going to want to share them with everyone you know. And if you send pictures to us, we will happily share them with the whole community of salamander people through our emails and field reports on our website. We love to do that, so please feel free to send us photos. Last is a few things that are optional. So for the most part, when you are moving animals across the road, it will be by hand and it will be one at a time. There are some sites which on some nights have such a profusion of amphibian activity that some of our more seasoned volunteers like to bring a bucket so that they can put a number of amphibians into that bucket, move them across the road all at the same time and gently release them on the other side. If you choose to do this, you need to make sure that that bucket is clean, that it doesn't have any bleach or cleansers or grease or any other things that could be absorbed through an amphibian's skin. Remember that amphibians are sensitive and have porous skin and so can be particularly vulnerable to toxins. You want to make sure you don't have any toxins in your bucket. Now another optional tool is a spatula or a scoop of some kind. If you're out there long enough you will eventually come across a road killed amphibian. You have a choice in that moment. You can completely ignore it, pretend that it doesn't exist, and go on about your business moving live amphibians off the road. But if you choose to count that dead amphibian on your data sheet, we ask that you remove it from the road. The reason for that is that if we have five people all walking past the same dead wood frog, we might think that we had five dead wood frogs when in fact we only had one. So if you're going to include dead animals on your data sheet, you need to remove them from the road. You can simply pick them up with your hands the way that you'd pick up a live amphibian, but some people don't like to do that and would prefer not to touch them. And so in that case, a spatula or a scoop can come in handy. So that's what you need to know and do before the big nights. How about on the big nights? On the big nights, you are going to head to your nearest crossing site or potential crossing site in need of investigation. We'll talk about that in a moment. When you get there and you're all set up in your reflective vest and with your flashlight, you're going to walk up and down the road, scanning the road with your flashlight for amphibians. And when you find them, you are going to move them across the road by hand in the direction they were going. Our goal is to move amphibians off the road faster than they can move themselves and therefore to decrease their risk of coming into contact with a car. Now these animals know where they're going. In the beginning of the season, nearly all of them will be heading to the breeding wetland. Midway through the season, you may have some animals leaving that wetland, their courtship and egg laying done for the year, and others just arriving. So it's really important to move them in the direction that they are headed. If they are um, pointed straight up and down the road and you can't tell which way they're going, then pick the dominant direction that most of the other amphibians seem to be moving on that night. You are also going to keep count of how many amphibians you move off the road by species. 
These counts are really important information for us for assessing whether sites might be good candidates for things like amphibian tunnels or road closures, and also just for sharing with the community to have a sense for what the migration was like that night. It's really great to team up with someone. We have one person moving the critters, calling out one wood frog, two peepers, one spotted salamander, and the other person keeping count on the data form. At the end of the night, it is really important to report your data. So if it just sits there on your data form in your house and isn't shared with us, then we're not able to make use of it for conservation. And then of course, first and foremost, your responsibility is to stay safe. We have an entire slideshow focused on staying safe and it is really vital that you watch that, but we'll go over some key elements in this next slide. So we have a separate slideshow devoted entirely to safety on big nights, but because it's such a critical consideration and it can't hurt to hear a few things twice, we're going to go over it very briefly here too. First and foremost, whenever you are out on the road, you should be wearing a reflective vest so that you are visible to cars. You should also have a bright light or perhaps two bright lights. Again, cell phone flashlights are not enough. You should be staying alert, looking and listening for vehicles at all time. And as soon as a car comes into view, you should be stepping aside off the road. Remember, our goal here is to move amphibians across the road faster than they can move themselves, not to stop traffic. We are not crossing guards. We are crossing brigades. You also should never shine your lights at cars, lest they catch a driver in the eye, creating an unsafe situation. And this one always sounds obvious, but there's always a moment when you might think that you can run out and grab an amphibian real quick before a car comes through. And bottom line is don't do it. Roads are slick on big night. It's easy to slip. It's easy for an amphibian to squirm out of your hands. You just have to step aside whenever a car comes by. Do not risk your life. Just wait it out, keep your fingers crossed and tend to that amphibian when the car has gone. Every year we hear from people who've heard that the oils on our hands can harm amphibians and that you should never touch them. This is a myth. As long as your hands are clean, wet, and free of toxins, it is safe to briefly handle amphibians, certainly safer than any contact they might have with a car tire. That said, there are plenty of things that we put on our hands that can be harmful to amphibians who readily absorb toxins through their skin. So if you're planning to handle amphibians, you should not have any perfume, lotion, bug spray, sunscreen, and certainly no hand sanitizer. We recommend washing your hands with soap and water before heading to the field, sticking your hands in a puddle as soon as you get there to keep them wet, and then washing with soap and water as soon as you get home, doing your best not to touch your face in between. COVID aside, it is not a great idea to touch your face after handling amphibians as some of them can secrete a defensive goo that might be an eye irritant. Nitrile gloves, Non-powdered are also a great option. In general, you wanna keep a gentle, firm hold around the center of their bodies. Don't squeeze too hard, but you wanna make sure that they don't squirm out of your hands. Do not pick them up by their legs or their tails. This can be harmful for them. And some salamanders have an adaptation of actually um, losing their tails in order to distract predators. And so if they perceive you as a predator, you might be left with a salamander tail and a salamander scurrying away. It takes a great deal of energy for them to regrow those tails. So we don't want them to see us as predators. Center of their bodies are the best way to hold them. And once you bring them to the other side of the road, release them gently. Don't toss, don't throw, don't drop them from waist height. So how do you know where to go on big night. Over the years, our volunteers have identified a number of amphibian crossing sites in the Monadnock region and beyond, which we feature on an interactive map that's available at harriscenter.org. Now this is just a screenshot of that map, but if you go to the Harris Center website and click on this image, it will open the map in a new window where it's fully interactive. You can zoom in, pan out, and click on any of these icons for more information about a particular site you'll see that we've grouped these sites into three categories based on how much information we have about them, as well as how closely we coordinate volunteer activity at any given site. 
The yellow salamanders denote our most well-established crossings. These are places volunteers have been going for many years and where we're fairly certain there will be a lot of amphibian activity if conditions are right. We have detailed information available for each of these sites, including parking, species info, and more, which you can download at harriscenter.org. Each year, we also do our best to line up a volunteer site coordinator to be a go-to person at each of these crossings on big nights, putting up salamander crossing signs, traffic cones, handing out data forms, that sort of thing. So if you're new to the crossing brigades and you live near one of these crossings, they're a great place to get started. You'll see that there are just a couple of crossings that are denoted with a white salamander. These are sites that have a fair amount of amphibian activity, but where we've discontinued volunteer coordination due to aggressive drivers or neighbors who were unsupportive of the Crossing Brigade project over the years. So if you choose to go to those sites, use caution. The vast majority of our sites, the green frog sites, are what we call our anecdotal sites. These are sites for which we have varying levels of information. We may have very detailed location information as well as specific counts for a number of big nights, or we may have something as simple as someone telling us they saw a spotted salamander on that road once. We've included all of them on our map so that we can provide as much information as possible for people who are looking to find crossing sites close to home, but there's widely variable information about these um, green frog sites. We're always looking for more information about these particular sites. Over the years, we've heard from more and more people outside of the Monadnock region who are looking to connect with other people to move amphibians across the road in their communities. So we've slowly expanded this map to include crossing sites that we've heard about in other parts of New Hampshire as well. The vast majority of the sites we know of are in the Monadnock region, but we do include some sites on the seacoast, in the North Country, and beyond. We are strictly limited to New Hampshire here as there are other organizations who coordinate crossings in Vermont, Massachusetts, and Maine, and they're a better place to go for information for those states. It's important to note that this map is by no means exhaustive or complete. There are many crossings we certainly don't know about, and we'd love your help to find them. Our goal is for people to drive as little as possible on big nights so that they're not inadvertently running amphibians over on their way to help other amphibians. And so we're adding new sites to this map all the time with the help of volunteers like you. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to find new crossing sites in a few minutes. An important element of the Salamander Crossing Brigades is sharing your data so that it can have a life beyond you. We share field reports with the Salamander Crossing Brigade community after each migration, and we also are often asked to share data with conservation commissions and other decision makers in local communities. So it's really important to turn in your counts. If you're at a site with a site coordinator, you can simply hand them your data form when you're checking out at the end of the night or verbally share your counts with them. If you're at a site without a site coordinator, we encourage you to come home and submit your counts and any photos you want to share with us via the online forums at harriscenter.org. The longer you wait, the less likely you are to actually do this. And then we will have lost all of that valuable information. So I encourage you as soon as possible, preferably the very night that you were out with the critters to submit your counts and photos at harriscenter.org. So we've talked a little bit about site coordinators, but I wanna share some more information about what these special volunteers do because we're always recruiting site coordinators for our well-established crossings in the Monadnock region. You might be new to this project now, but in another year or two, perhaps you'd consider volunteering as a site coordinator too. The most difficult thing that site coordinators do is agree to stick around for the duration of salamander season and to be on the road if there is a big night. All of our other volunteers, we tell you to come if you can and stay as long as you like, but we ask our site coordinators to make an effort to be there for migrations. They also familiarize themselves with their crossing site so they can answer questions about parking, what species you're likely to see, whether it's family friendly, and sometimes we ask them to go out and assess conditions on the ground, such as whether the ground has thawed there yet or if it's still snow covered. They also keep track of field equipment. So the sites with site coordinators are sites where we're able to have salamander crossing signs and traffic cones to slow traffic. They also have data forms to hand out to volunteers, amphibian ID sheets, extra reflective vests and pencils on hand. 
They orient volunteers to each site. So we ask you to check in with a site coordinator if there is one at your site and to check out at the end of the night when you go. When you check in, they'll let you know any important information for that particular night. They'll give you a data form on write in the rain paper if you need it. You can tell who the site coordinators are because they'll be wearing reflective vests that say Harris Center on the back in reflective lettering. They also are available to share information with passers-by. Sometimes drivers stop and want to know what the heck we're doing out there, and our site coordinators are happy to talk to them. They can help you identify amphibian species, and then they collect and submit amphibian counts from their site at the end of each night in a timely fashion so that we can get our field report out to everyone else as soon as possible. So again, if this sounds like something you might be interested in doing, drop us a line. We're always looking for additional folks to serve as site coordinators. We love to line up more than one for each site so that if one person has a meeting or is out of town, the other one can um, serve the site coordinator role in the event of a migration. So if this sounds like something that might be up your alley, drop us a line. We'd be happy to talk with you about it. So we've talked about a lot of the details on big nights. Now let's pull them all together into a little timeline of what to expect on big nights. When to go out, how long to stay, what to do when you're there. So most of our volunteers arrive at their crossing sites shortly after sunset, as amphibian activity won't really get going until it's dark. If you've driven there, make sure to park safely, well off the road and not in anyone's driveway. And then before you leave your car, make sure you have everything you need for a safe and comfortable time on the road. Reflective vest, flashlight, headlamp, pencil. If you wear glasses, you wanna make sure you have a brimmed cap to keep rain off of your glasses. If you're at one of our well-established crossing sites and there's a site coordinator, we ask that you check in with them upon arrival. They can give you a data form. They can also orient you to anything you might need to know about that site on that particular night. You'll know if there's a site coordinator there because there will be salamander crossing signs or traffic cones, and you'll see someone in a reflective vest that says Harris Center on the back in reflective lettering. Those are our site coordinators. If you're at a site that doesn't have a site coordinator, you can just get going as soon as you arrive, but you wanna be extra careful around traffic because there won't be cones or signs to alert drivers to your presence on the road. Once you've checked in with your site coordinator, you're basically going to walk slowly up and down the road. We suggest that you walk in the lane facing traffic for safety's sake so that you can see oncoming cars better. Um, and then you're scanning the pavement with your flashlight and you're looking for little rocks with upturned ends, those are often frogs, or for leaves or wiggly sticks, those are often salamanders. When you find one, you're going to move it across the road in the direction that it was heading. You're going to note it on your data sheet by species, and you're gonna keep going that way throughout the night. As we've said, we do like to collect information on road killed animals, so if you find a dead animal, you can note that on your data sheet as well. We do ask that you remove it from the road if you've included it on your data sheet. It's great to work in teams where one person shuttles salamanders across the road and the other person records data. Now, amphibians will migrate all night long if conditions are right. But there are times when amphibian activity can slow or stop entirely, and that's when temperatures might drop below 40 degrees or the rain might stop and the road might start to dry up, and then amphibian activity will, amphibians will kind of just hunker down and amphibians activity will slow for the night. So you can, you can know that it's time to leave when there's not a lot of amphibian activity on the road, but also you get to decide how much time you spend. Some people spend half an hour, other people are out there for four or five hours. It's really up to you. Many of our volunteers tend to stay till 10 or 11 at night if there's a ton of amphibian activity on the road. If you're at a site with a site coordinator, we do ask that you check out with them when it's time to leave. You can share your accounts with them to be included in all the counts for that particular site. And it's also just a nice safety measure so that they know that you're leaving. Um, and we also collect information on volunteer efforts. So start time and end time is a big part of that. If you're driving, of course, you want to drive very slowly and carefully on your way home, lest you hit any critters on the way. And when you 
do get home, if you were at a site where there was no site coordinator, we ask you to head straight to your computer or phone and to enter your counts via the online form at harriscenter.org and to share any photos with us as well. Um, these are, can be photos that are just fun photos from Big Night that you want to share with the Greater Salamander Brigade community or photos of species that you need some help identifying. The sooner you get that data in, the sooner we're able to share it with other people. So we encourage you not to wait too long. What if you've looked closely at our map and there simply aren't any known amphibian crossing sites near you? We generally discourage people from driving long distances on migration nights, both because weather conditions could be very different from one site to the next, and also because how many amphibians might you inadvertently run over on your way to help other amphibians? There are very likely amphibian road crossings occurring in every town in the Granite State, and we need your help to put them on the map. So if you don't see any crossings in your town on our map, the next best thing to do is to perform a driving survey on big nights to try to investigate several potential crossing locations and get more information about them. You're going to start by doing some of the same things all of us are doing. You're going to watch the weather for conditions that are right for migration. You're going to watch the clock and head out after dark. You're also going to watch for wetlands, and this is something you can plan out ahead of time before big night. The vast majority of our known crossings occur when there is a vernal pool, pond, lake, or wetland on one side of the road and a forested hillside on the other. So think about your town and identify a few locations ahead of time where that configuration exists and plan to go and check them out on big night. Another way to find potential crossing sites is to check out iNaturalist.org. iNaturalist is a website and an app where community scientists all over the world can report species observations. You can search by species and by town. So look for spotted salamander, wood frog, spring peeper, or Jefferson salamander observations on or near roads in your town and you might just find a new crossing site. When you're doing driving surveys, we recommend bringing a friend or a family member so that one of you can focus on looking for amphibians and the other one can focus on driving safely. It's also more fun with a friend. When you're nearing a potential crossing site that you've identified, drive slowly, 15 miles per hour max. Any faster than that and you won't be able to see small amphibians on the road. We also recommend that you turn off the radio, roll down the windows, and listen carefully. The quacking of wood frogs or peeping of spring peepers might be the first sign that you're nearing a crossing. Be sure to scan the whole road, both lanes, for amphibians. Remember, at a site without crossing brigade volunteers to help move them across, you're more likely to see a higher number of dead amphibians. They stay on the road longer than live ones do. So your first sign that you're nearing a crossing site might be a hopping frog or a crawling salamander, but it also might be a collection of roadkill. If you do find a site with a number of amphibians, live or dead on the road, and you're prepared for being out of your car, meaning that you have a reflective vest, rain gear, flashlight, you might want to consider spending a little time at that site to investigate it. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, depending on how many critters you find. The first step, of course, is making sure to park safely, well off the road, and not in people's driveways or in front of their houses, which can make them understandably nervous. You can download data forms for scouting out new crossing sites at harriscenter.org. The first page is some basic information about who you are, information about the site's location with as much detail as possible so that we can help other people find it again if it turns out to be a good site, some basic weather information and time that you're out there, because if you're out there on a night when the road is dry and it's 38 degrees, we're not gonna assume it's not a crossing site because those are suboptimal conditions. However, if you're out there and it's 48 degrees and wet and nine o'clock at night and you still aren't seeing critters, that could be a sign that it's not a great crossing site. There's also room for comments. In general, we're looking for sites that have enough traffic where our efforts could make a difference, but not so much traffic that it could be a safety hazard for our volunteers. And the backside is for tallying species, just like you would 
at any other crossing site. We ask that you fill out a separate form for each site that you visit. So if you've scouted out three sites in a night, that would be three forms. And then you can submit this data in the same place you would submit data from known crossings through our online form. Um, if you feel that that's a little bit too limiting for the information you want to share, particularly around location, you can also just take photos of the front and back of your data form and submit them through our photo portal. And that's it. There's one more fun aspect of the Salamander Crossing Brigades to share with you, and that is a special project to document the spot patterns of spotted salamanders at crossing sites that we visit year after year. Many people are surprised to learn that the spot patterns on spotted salamanders are a bit like fingerprints on human, unique to that individual. So by photographing these salamanders and comparing photos from one year to the next, we can actually tell whether we're seeing the same individual over and over again. As a reminder, spotted salamanders can live upwards of 20 years if they're not eaten by barred owls or hit by cars. So this can provide some really interesting data on survivorship and longevity in our salamander populations that we see at our amphibian crossing sites. For example, here's a spotted salamander that we encountered on both its inbound migration into its breeding wetland and its migration away from its breeding wetland a few weeks later. How do we know that it's the same salamander? We started by looking at these two spots that are spaced far apart, then these two that are attached, then the three at the base of the head. Just to prove that those first two photos weren't a fluke, here's another salamander that we encountered on both its inbound and outbound migrations in 2014, the year we started the spot pattern project. You can see that these spots are the same as well as the crown on the head. The closer you look, the more distinct these patterns begin to appear. We've now identified 35 individual salamanders that have been encountered on at least two different occasions at our North Lincoln Street Crossing in Keene. That number includes 24 individual salamanders at that site that have been encountered on two or more different years, though not necessarily consecutively. This lucky salamander was moved across North Lincoln Street by our volunteers five years in a row from 2014 through 2018. Possibly more than that, except we didn't start taking these spot pattern photos until 2014, so we don't have information about individual salamanders dating back to earlier years. So if you'd like to take spot pattern photographs for inclusion in our database, here are a few tips. First, stick with spotties. Although we love to see and share photos of all kinds of amphibians, only spotted salamanders have these uniquely identifiable patterns. So for this database, it's spotted salamanders only. Next, the true value in this database lies in being able to compare photos from year to year. So for this, we want to stick with our well-established crossings, specifically these five, Jordan Road in Keene, North Lincoln Street in Keene, Swansea Lake Road in Swansea, Matthews Road in Swansea, and Nelson Road in Nelson. These are the five sites where we have the most robust collection of photographs so far and where future photographs will make the most difference. For your photos to be useful as spot pattern data, you need to photograph the salamander's head and back from above and make sure that both sides of the salamander are clearly visible. Photos from directly above are the most useful. So while this one is adorable, it's no good for spot pattern data. Same thing here. This is what we're going for here. It's best if you can put the salamander on something that has limited glare, like your data form or clipboard. Some of our sites, our site coordinators will have light boxes, which are modified coolers that have LED lights in them, where you can photograph the salamander inside the light box. But really, any data form or clipboard is a fine background. We now have thousands of photos in our spot pattern database. So it's really helpful for us if you can submit just one photo per salamander. So we don't have to sort through all your images to figure out how many salamanders they represent. Pick the best one for each critter and send that. We also need a few key pieces of information in order to make best use of the spot pattern photo. Without this information, it's just a photo. With this information, it's data. First is the date, including the year, the next is the site. 
And if you're really savvy and you want to consider renaming your file names to help us out on the data management end of things, you can also assign a unique number for each individual salamander that you photographed that night. So for instance, if this salamander was photographed at Jordan Road on April 15th, 2018, and it was the first salamander of the night, you could rename that photo file to say Jordan Road 4151801. And if you submitted a second photo of a second salamander from that very same site and that very same night, that would be Jordan Road 4151802. Now, if this last part just sounds like gobbledygook to you or crazy tech speak, you can ignore that part, but we do still need date and site in order to make sense of the information. A few final thoughts on the value of community science projects like this one. Every year, people ask me how the salamanders are doing, how their populations compare from one year to the next or from one site to another site. Now, because Everything about this project varies greatly from year to year. It's really hard to answer that question. For instance, if we had the exact same number of salamanders at two different sites, and one of those sites had two volunteers, and the other site had 20, it stands to reason that 20 volunteers would encounter a larger proportion of the salamanders. And so we might think we had more salamanders than the other site when it was exactly the same. Similarly, we have some years when the rains all come at 2 or 3 a.m., when nobody's out to see or to keep count. And our counts are very low for those years. It doesn't mean the migration didn't happen or that there weren't frogs and salamanders active at all of our sites. It just means we weren't there to count them. And this variability makes it very difficult to make sweeping statements about salamander populations in our region. If we really wanted to do that at some of our sites, we would do what is pictured in these photos, which is set up something called a pitfall array. This is fencing that can be set up around a breeding wetland or a crossing site. And when a salamander or frog comes into contact with that fencing and they can't get where they wanna go, they can't move through it to their breeding wetland, they walk or hop along it until they encounter a trap that has been dug into the ground. That's what you see on the right there. And they fall into that trap where they wait for a highly caffeinated graduate student to come and record them and measure them and release them on the other side of the fence. This is how you find out information about how many salamanders exist in a given population and how they're doing from one year to another. It is fascinating work and it is incredibly labor intensive, and we just don't have the capacity to do that here. But just because it isn't rigorous, exhaustive data collection the way academic researchers might do, doesn't mean it's not valuable. Here's one example. This is a piece of land alongside our North Lincoln Street crossing site in Keene, New Hampshire in 2008. The land was cleared and a for sale sign popped up and the Keene Conservation Commission was reviewing a permit application to put several houses on this property. Our crossing brigade program was fairly new back then, but they'd heard that there were people out there moving animals off the road in this vicinity. And so they called me and they said, what can you tell us about this site? How does it compare to other crossing brigade sites? Is it important for amphibians? And I said, well, I can't really tell you how it compares to other sites for the same reasons we've just talked about. But what I can tell you is that the other night, in the span of four hours, 20 volunteers came out and they moved 838 frogs across the road and all of those frogs were going onto that piece of property. 838 frogs. What if I had simply said, there's a lot of frogs there without a number attached to it? What does a lot mean? Is it 10? Is it a hundred? Is it a thousand? The numbers tell a story that words can't tell. And in this case, they were so compelling that the Conservation Commission not only declined the permit application, but they opted to purchase this land for conservation in the city of Keene because of its importance as a migratory amphibian pathway. If we hadn't had the numbers of amphibians or the numbers of people, who were putting their own comfort aside to go out on rainy nights and move animals off the road and so demonstrated a real depth of concern and care for these critters in their community, 
that land might never have been protected. Starting in 2018, the city of Keene took it one step further and began working with the Harris Center to close the road at the North Lincoln Street crossing site to vehicles on big nights, specifically to protect migrating amphibians and to provide a safe space for people to witness the magic of the migration. They were the first and so far only community in all of New Hampshire to do so. But we hope to work with Keene and other local towns to implement amphibian detours in the future based on the data collected by our Salamander Crossing Brigade volunteers. In addition, our volunteers have provided safe passage for more than 53,000 amphibians since the project's inception in 2006. That's 53,000 more opportunities to court, to breed, to lay eggs, to survive another year. As we wrap up, we're going to leave you with some homework assignments if you want to become a Salamander Crossing Brigade volunteer. First, please read our volunteer handbook, which is chock full of helpful information and will really reinforce what you've learned during this slideshow. You can download it on the Salamander Crossing Brigade volunteer materials page at harriscenter.org. Please watch the other training slideshows, which are much shorter than this one. We've got one on amphibian ecology and conservation, one on species ID, and one on safety, which is the most important of the three. You can find them at harriscenter.org or on the Harris Center's YouTube channel. Gather your field gear, reflective vest, flashlight, rain jacket. Sign up for our email list if you want to be counted among our volunteers and to hear from us when we think migrations are likely, as well as field reports from big nights and other salamander related news. There's a sign up form at harriscenter.org. And lastly, we ask that if you do want to volunteer with us, you please fill out our online liability waiver. Just take a moment or so. We do need one for everyone who wishes to volunteer in a family. So parents, that means one for each one of your kids. Thank you. As you can imagine, we get a huge amount of salamander related correspondence during salamander season, and it's not always possible to respond to every email in a timely fashion. If you still have questions, we strongly encourage you to check out the information on the Salamander Crossing Brigade web pages at harriscenter.org. We have an FAQ, we have downloadable data forms and amphibian ID sheets, we have field reports from this season and every other season, We've got that map of crossing sites, salamander forecast, and we even have a list of crossing brigade programs throughout the Northeast. So if this is something you're really excited about, but you don't live in New Hampshire, check out that page. You might be able to connect with a community group or individual who's doing amphibian crossings closer to home for you. Thank you so much for your attention and your enthusiasm for amphibians and we hope to see you on the next big night.